Warning, this video contains PC speaker sound effects. With its wide variety of add-on boards, the PC was capable of some incredible soundtracks. While other platforms may do, with simple free voice sound generators, FM synthesis, or crunchy low bitrate samples for their music, PC owners could enjoy rich, fully orchestrated music from their big beige boxes, provided they had a sound card fitted. Or could they? When introduced in 1987, a Roland MT32 was $695, far beyond the budget of all but the wealthiest PC owners. Most gamers of this era would have heard music like this. FM Synthesis, from the wide variety of budget Sound Blaster clones that hit the market shortly after the launch of Creative's original in 1989. This came courtesy of Yamaha's OPL2 and OPL3 chips, which first debuted with the Adlib Music Card in 1987. But this meant that until well into the 1990s, and the rise of the multimedia PC standard, game developers could not safely assume PC users would have a sound card fitted. So what was the alternative? using the humble internal speaker. The PC's built-in sound hardware was dated even at the time of its release in 1981, with all but the most budget of home computers coming out with free voice sound chips. But remember, this was a business machine, and the sound hardware was merely provided for letting you know you'd made an error in your spreadsheet. All you can do with the PC speaker is toggle it between on or off. If you do that once, all you'll get is a tiny click as the speaker moves just once. But if you toggle between on and off at a regular frequency, you'll get a constant tone, specifically a square wave. Changing the frequency gives you different notes, something very familiar to anyone who cut their teeth programming in QBasic. The PC's interval timer has a channel specifically for this toggling on and off, so the CPU only has to send a single command, rather than using its limited cycles to constantly feed the speaker with commands to turn it on and off. Despite this humble hardware, even early games tweaked those frequencies multiple times per second to produce simple sound effects and music, like the port of 1984's Alley Cat. However, at this level of fidelity, I suspect that it probably doesn't have a Stray Cat Strut performed by Brian Setzer and the Stray Cats, licensed from Arista Music, anywhere in the credits. But while the basic beeper was sufficient to recognisably plagiarise pop songs, the PC was far from an all-singing gaming platform. Even IBM realised that a few small upgrades would make it a much better proposition as a home computer, which is why the budget-priced PCJR of 1984 came with 16 colour graphics and a free voice Texas Instruments sound chip. Had the PCJR been successful, perhaps PC games from the second half of the 80s would all have featured multi-channel sound. But the only clone to replicate its hardware was the Tandy 1000, and most IBM compatibles retained the basic beeper. While a few games from the mid-80s offered Tandy as a tantalising and mysterious option to tempt regular PC owners, in reality, these were little more than minor upgrades on the standard PC speaker soundtrack. The launch of the Commodore Amiga in 1985 made even these free voice chips sound like farts in a dented trumpet. With four channels of digitised PCM sound, Amiga games would treat us to the wonders of tracker music. Close enough to the real thing, that unlicensed recreations started to be replaced by official collaborations with the artists. By the time the Bitmap Brothers were imbibing beers with Betty Boo, the PC had evolved from its four-colour CGA beginnings to something that looked like a proper gaming machine, with fast CPUs and 256-colour VGA becoming the norm. But what to do about the sound? Here's the Amiga version of Xenon 2, featuring trackerized beats from Bomb the Bass, another Bitmap Brothers blowout for the letter B. This is actually within the realms, where I'm starting to wonder about copyright strikes. And here's the PC version. For 1989, this is one of the last holdouts for not having any kind of sound card support, but you can see why those sample-heavy Amiga songs wouldn't have translated well to the Roland or Adlib. But it's really quite an impressive use of the old beeper. That said, Xenon 2 isn't doing anything much different than Alley Cat does for its rendition of Stray Cat Strut, just done very well. It's a trick even us Teenage Q Basic programmers knew. The PC speaker plays notes by using the interval timer to toggle its circuit on and off 
the frequency of that note. It's always full output or no output. This results in monophonic sound. You only hear one note at a time. Here's some Cubasic code to do exactly that. But what if you played two notes in quick succession? You get the illusion of polyphony. And if you were to spend a lot of time carefully crafting these arpeggiated trills, you could make something like that Xenon 2 soundtrack. Clever as it is, this is still some way from the kind of music Amiga owners were enjoying. It was inevitable some developers would try to replicate the feat on lesser audio hardware. Here's Kronos, a 1987 game for the ZX Spectrum, a computer with a similar buzzer setup to the PC. However, these were rare, and most developers relied on the careful assemblage of arpeggios. But what if you could get the PC to play any old digitized sound you wanted, just like the Amiga's Paula chip? There's something interesting about the PC speaker. While the only positions available in software were fully on or fully off, the speaker is still an analog device. If you cycle power fast enough, it will be equivalent to supplying it with less power. This is similar to the principle applied by 1-bit DACs. If you could cut out the timer and stream bits directly to the speaker at a high enough rate, it would result in a perfectly reproduced waveform. There's only one problem with this. Let me illustrate it with the first PC game I've been able to find that used digitized speech. To Firstly, I should point out that this game is Warrior of Rus, Volume 1, Dungeon, from 1982. So much for my nice clean narrative about the Amiga influencing digitized sound for the PC. I can't find out exactly which month this was released, but if it was before October, then this game with digitized sound predates the availability of the first widespread consumer digital audio format, the CD. It also sounds, much like those early CDs, not good. This method of bit-banging the speaker could in theory produce high fidelity sound, all the way up to SACD quality sample rates, but it's a CPU intensive process you'd need a 127 megahertz version of the 8088 just to provide the music, and that simply didn't exist in the 1980s. Just to get these low quality samples to work, the developers had to give up on all the usual timers and interrupts of the PC and send audio to the speaker as fast as the 8088 could go. You'll notice that nothing else happens while the digitized sample is playing. It's all the computer can do. Worse, if you run this on something faster than an 8088, the sampled sound will run at the faster instruction frequency of that processor and become a garbled mess. Digitized sound for the PC wouldn't emerge again until 1987. This is one of those 1987 games, Whizball. The graphics were a painful CGA nightmare, but the sound's up there with the Amiga port although fans say no port plays, quite like the C64 original. Another Amiga port to retain its soundtrack, if not graphics that are safe to view without special goggles, is Crazy Cars. As with Dungeon, these appear to dispense with all interrupts and run as fast as possible, relying on 286 users to prod that turbo button to slow their computer down. However, these games are using a different technique to Dungeon's bit-banging approach, one of the speaker drive modes offered by the PC was a one-shot mode, where you could send a value to the timer. The speaker would go high for that duration, then go low until another command was sent. This means, rather than trying to bit-bang a one-bit direct stream, the timer could be used to send pulses of variable width, a technique similar to a modern Class D amplifier. This also reduced the frequency at which new data needed to be sent, to the point where the system interrupts could be used. On an 8088-based system such as the XT, the limit at which samples can be sent using the interrupts is around 20,000 times per second, or 20 kHz. This doesn't give the CPU time to do anything else, but if it's just playing music for a static title screen or sound samples while nothing else is happening, that's not a problem. With the 1.19 MHz interrupt timer of the PC, there's a limit to how precise our pulse lengths can be, so at 20 kHz we'd only have enough cycles left for 5 bits of precision for volume. Most games using this PWM approach strike a compromise of 6-bit sound at around 16 kHz. 
If you run these games through an emulator, you'll probably hear the carrier wave where the PWM always turns on at that fixed frequency of 16 kHz. But original PC speakers would heavily attenuate tones of such high frequency, providing good sound for the time. One of the most impressive uses of this approach is found in Lauriciel's racing games, where Space Race even includes sampled speech. Hello. Note that nothing on the screen is moving while this happens. All of the PC's power is being used to play the digitized sound. They're also using the timer interrupts, so this runs at correct speed on any PC, unlike the earlier games. Steve Witzel of Access Software discovered the same thing, but for this implementation, Access managed to patent it as real sound. The first game to feature real sound was World Class Leaderboard. Golf games were ideal for this processor-hungry audio system, as the CPU had little to do beyond animate a single ball, and the action could stop entirely for longer samples. Ooh, can't be too happy about that one. Real sound was also used for links in 1990. One peculiarity of the PWM approach was it relied on the frequency and behaviour of the Intel 825 free timer chip, and every so often a PC clone would find some way of cheapening the build by swapping this sort of component out for a less costly but not quite compatible version. So, while I remember playing World Class Leaderboard on a Viglin 386, I don't remember the digitised sound as it came out as unintelligible mush. The downside of Access patenting PWM was it disappeared from any game whose developer didn't want to licence real sound. However, the demo scene and its wider community had never worried so much about such trivial things as trademark and copyright law, so PWM PC speaker sound regularly turned up as an output option for trackers and mod players into the 90s. Here's a well-known one, Galaxy Player. Something impressive here is that this is doing something while the PC speaker audio plays. In addition to playing the audio, Galaxy Player is having to process and mix the samples which make the music in real time. It's clever and very fast, but not magic. This only works because it targets faster CPUs. In fact, Galaxy Player has the odd feature that if you have a Sound Blaster card, it will run on an 8088XT, but playing back via the PC speaker requires a mid-range 286, even for low sample rates. The reason for this is the Sound Blaster card could perform direct memory access. Rather than the CPU having to keep feeding the speaker with new samples, it could simply tell the sound card where in memory they were kept and let it play them without further intervention. As a result, action didn't need to stop every time a sound played. 1989's Mean Streets was the last real sound game to offer PC speaker support only. When Access released Countdown in 1990, real sound had gained Sound Blaster support and the game manual contained a warning that playing with PC speaker sound would require a fast CPU to prevent the game from slowing down every time a sound was played. Make sure he remembers nothing. Don't worry, I'll take care of him. Of course, this hasn't prevented people from wanting to go back and relive that artistry, such as in Hornet's CRTC and Desires demo for the IBM PC, 8088 miles per hour. In addition to many clever composite CGA hacks, this features a module player which can both process and play the module over the PC speaker. It does this by using the PWM method without interrupts, counting individual cycles to make sure the timing is correct. Needless to say, this requires cycle accurate emulation or original hardware. PC games would go on to eclipse all the other classic 16-bit computers during the 90s, gaining 16-bit CD quality sound, wavetable synthesis, redbook audio, and, at the turn of the 2000s, MP3 soundtracks with hours of licensed music. Although there were some holdouts for the old ways of doing things, with Unreal Tournament featuring a tracker file soundtrack as late as 1999. Although not, sadly, with PC speaker support.